Hello, welcome to Legal Ease, a half hour presentation of the Northern Middlesex Bar Association, designed to bring to the public uh, some issues of legal interest uh, that hopefully you will uh, uh, enjoy. Uh, today's program, uh, today's topic is restorative justice. Uh, I'm your host, Attorney Christopher Lilly, and I am joined by two special guests. We have Erin Freeborn of the Communities for Restorative Justice. Welcome, Erin. Thank you. And we have Matthew Pennard, Sergeant Matthew Pennard of the Littleton Police Department. Welcome, Matt. Okay, why don't we start, um, I'm going to ask you, Erin, to explain what is restorative justice? Restorative justice is actually a set of principles and practices that center around a few key principles. For instance, that harm or conflict and essentially crime is not just about a law being broken or a rule being broken. It's more about the relationships involved and the people who are harmed. So there are a set of questions that we can think about when we think about crimes in our communities. A lot of times we say, what law was broken? What should the punishment be? But for restorative justice, we want to look at that a little differently and say, who was hurt here? Whose responsibility is it? And who should be held accountable? Who is responsible for making things as right as possible? And that's, that's the underpinning for everything that we do. And we really just try to bring, bring people together who have been affected to talk about how to repair harm. Now you are newly named as the Executive Director of the Communities for Restorative Justice. Can you yes. tell us what that organization is about? Yes. Communities for Restorative Justice it has been around for 15 years. It started in 2000, and it is a police partnership, police community partnership primarily, and that means we have 12 towns that we work with. Their chiefs have all identified restorative justice yeah. as a, a, a belief that they think is valuable and a way to deal with conflicts in their communities. So we take referrals primarily from the police department, but we also take referrals from other sources. So for instance, we can accept referrals um, from the district attorney's office or through the court, or um, even most recently we had a referral directly from a judge. And in that case, we worked at the district level. So an adult offender, we worked closely with probation. So this is, um, we're looking at a diversion of, of a situation from the, what might ultimately go through the court system, correct? Yes, and most often. And we're talking often. about um, approaching it from a different approach, and the, 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 the approach of restorative justice. Matt, yeah. um, what is a good case that you would be looking at for, uh, that, that might be addressed for restorative justice? Now, before, before I have you yeah, answer no. that question, yeah. let, me, um, let me ask, you, Littleton is one of the communities that, that yeah. is, uh, part of the C4RJ community, correct? Correct. So Matt, you're involved with, the, with this. Very. I, how, really how have you been involved? Um, John Kelly, the prior chief, uh, and I got together and we met with Chief Weatherby from Concord, who was a real driving force behind restorative justice and, um, and kind of like get us, got us on board in regards to it. Um, and our thought was, you know, some of the cases that we're bringing to um, adult court or juvenile court that are, I wouldn't say petty, but um, taking a lot of the court's time and there's real no resolution to it um, where the defendant goes with a defense attorney in front of the judge and there's a $50 fine and they walk away. There's no real uh, restoration of the harms that have caused in the community. And uh, we, we believe that with restorative justice and the C4RJ program, we were able to um, give us another tool to kind of come to a resolution in regards to a crime that committed. So what sorts of uh, cases might you refer? Well, you know, Chris, um, a, a good case is a case that has a victim. And when I say a victim, it may not just be a one person. It may be, um, you know, property damage to like the conservation rail trails. Um, we've had that where we have someone from the conservation committee come in. You know, the community is actually the one that's harmed because the rail trails are destroyed, the signs were destroyed. They were tagged, um, they were ripped down, and we found the offender. Well, you know as well as I know, if it goes to court with a case like that, um, yourself is going to defend the subject in front of the judge. And when they're there, you know, they'll pay the restitution and whatnot. But the victim really never gets their day in court. 
you know, the people that have to go and fix these signs, the people that have to go and repair these trails that have been damaged, they never really get their day in court, you know, and the offender really doesn't get their face, the victim at this point in time. So what restorative justice does is it puts those two one-on-one -on -one so the, the offender can actually see what harms they've created throughout the whole community. And that benefits both the victim and the offender. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, um, a typical case can go to court probably uh, at a minimum five, maybe six times uh, if it gets continued on a certain um, uh, issue or if something comes up with an officer or the DA has to push it on. And this is the victim coming to the, to the case, coming to the court, you know, possibly five different times. Whereas we hold a pretty tight schedule when we run the circle and the victim and the offender are there in the same room on a time that we mutually agree upon. Okay, you just use the term circle. Erin, uh, can you explain what the circle is? Yes, um, a circle is essentially what it does sound like. Uh, we move the tables out of the way, we put our chairs in a circle, and it provides the opportunity for people to look at each other and for people to listen to each other without any obstructions. And our process does use a talking piece, so oftentimes it'll be a stone or, or something along those lines. But the process can go forward with or without that item. And that item could really be anything from something significant to something simple. For instance, your ink pen could be the talking piece if, if we wanted to have the process right now. And in that process, there's a facilitator, a circle keeper actually, that guides the conversation and will ask certain questions. Oftentimes the questions are, um, what were you thinking and feeling at the time? And every person in the circle has the opportunity to talk about that. They have the opportunity, for instance, maybe little Johnny obviously will answer the question, what were you thinking and feeling at the time? But then also the question oftentimes will be very important for little Johnny's mom to say, what were you thinking and feeling at the time when the police department called you and said, we have little Johnny at the station? And then to the victim as well, it's very meaningful to ask that question. What were you thinking and feeling at the time where you found your home broken into? What were you thinking and feeling at the time when the police department called and said, uh, there's been this sort of disruption? And it's really meaningful to go through that for each party. And in the circle process, there are those sets of questions that we'll work through. Every person has an opportunity to answer. And the whole group, the goal is to come up with a plan. It's a repair plan, and it's similar to a contract that the offender and the group come to collaboratively. And that, I think, yeah. is the value. It creates buy-in from the person who has committed the offense, but also the victim. The victim has a say in the exact outcome, and the police department does as well. Right. So, so who participates in the circle? We always have a police officer. Yeah, and I think that, you know, to, to, to put it out there is, mm -hmm. is the, the start of the circle process is we break down the actual law that was broken mm -hmm. uh, and explain, um, you know, how they did commit the crime mm -hmm. and what the actual penalty could be, you know, if they went to a, a court process. So was this the first time that the offender has contact with C4RJ communities for restorative justice? Is at the circle stage or no. is there some no. sort of intake? No. How, there, there how does that work? Mm -hmm. There's an intake process where we uh, ask a lot of questions to okay. try and understand the person on the whole, mm -hmm. not just the offense. And we really believe the person is not defined by their one act and that there's so much more that this one person, oftentimes yeah. juveniles, I would say that about 83% of our cases last year were 20 to 21 year olds and below. Okay. But restorative justice works for any age. Last year we had cases for eight year olds all the way up to 53 year olds. I think we, we probably even, even we, had like an 80-year-old. We even right? referred an 80-year-old. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So it can be valuable for anyone. And um, But is it fair to say that the circle is kind of the point where everything converges and, and a lot of the magic, I guess, happens? True. Oh, absolutely. True. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and okay. Aaron spoke about that earlier, you know, whenever he goes around and tells, you know, what you were feeling. And if, if you have a, a victim that's sitting there telling you how they felt, the offender actually has to sit there, Chris, directly across them saying, wow, I didn't realize I caused that much fear. I didn't realize I caused that much shame to them. And they, they see that one-on-one -on -one rather than in a courtroom where the judge and the, the two DAs are actually doing, doing the talking. Mm -hmm. Now, you're part of the circle. Absolutely. What is your role? So again, um, the first part of the circle is to 
basically give a quick synopsis of the case itself. And after we give a synopsis of the case, we talk about the law that was broken, you know, malicious destruction of property, mm -hmm. uh, a, a, a larceny of some sort, uh, a petty theft, a shoplifting, any of those that come up. Uh, we break that law down and explain, you know, how it was broken. And then we tell exactly what the penalty possibly could be, what the most likely outcome will be in court, but what the maximum penalty could be if they were to go to court. Okay. And you asked about preparation. I, yeah. d I do want to say that there is a lot of preparation that goes in on both sides, mm -hmm. trying to make sure that the offender really is thoughtful going through this process and tries to unpack some of the underlying reasons that they might have committed this offense. But also we, we prepare with the victim and their supporters to try and make sure that they're ready to see this person, ready to get what mm -hmm. they need out of the process. And then the circle happens, which is of course the focus. Mm -hmm. At C4RJ we have sort of a two-stage circle process. We have the opening circle where people come up with a plan. The plan. And then at the end, after the plan is carried out and the, the offender has worked for a while, then there will be a closing circle. And that's an opportunity for people to come back together. The victim and offender might only see each other at those two junctures, mm -hmm. but at each of those they're able to engage as much as they want to. So the goal of the circle is to come up with a plan? Yes. Um, are there any concerns going into the circle about what somebody might be bringing to the table, whether it be an offender or a victim, or somebody, in, and either I, one of you. I think that's a great question, mm -hmm. and that's why we do an extensive background, both with the victim, the offender, and the police that were actually responded that night. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. we're all human, and you know, they can still be some tempers that may fly, and we have to make sure that we get that out in the open before we have a circle. Mm -hmm. um, I've been involved in dozens of circles now, and I don't think I've had one that has has, has gone awry at all. Okay. And we've uh, we've. It's an opportunity for the offender to make whole before it actually goes to a court process. So I think they're more willing to go through the circle and follow the process. Okay. You know, and if I could touch upon a point that you spoke about er earlier, in the background of finding out how a person is defined, um, a lot of the collaboration that we come together, uh, we may actually, um, in, in the agreement, send a, um, a younger person that maybe we think has some alcohol related issues to an AA meeting. We may say as one of their mandates that they have to attend an AA meeting or they have to attend at least five sessions of uh, therapy with you know, a licensed therapist. These are some of the things and some of the agreements that we can come up with. Now is that part of the plan or is that something that might be a condition <coughs> to getting into the circle? It can come in at both places okay. actually. Um, for instance, if at intake, if we determine, and we as in our staff and our case coordinators who are our more experienced volunteers, if we determine that there might be some sort of risk, sometimes yeah. we will require uh, an evaluation either by uh, a substance abuse counselor or mm -hmm. program or by a mental health professional to try and determine if this person is capable of proceeding with the process and also to make sure that they're willing to, willing and, to. and ready to take it on. Uh, because that's really important and you want to make sure that you understand that before you do too much work with the victim because we certainly never want to put anyone in a position where they could become re-victimized or that they're going into a process that might be um, unpredictable or unsafe. Yeah. So those are things that we try and, and build against. So it could be at the front end that we do those things mm -hmm. or it could be part of the plan. Mm -hmm. right. So let's say you find a situation where uh, unfortunately it doesn't look like it's going in the right direction. What happens in that case to, to those types of cases? It goes uh, back to yeah. the referring party. Yeah. Um, it goes back to you. It goes back to uh, us. Yeah. And, <clears throat> you know, we really try to, try to make it work. Um, mm -hmm. After we come up with an agreement, mm -hmm. Chris, we'll, we'll, the facilitator will work with the, uh, the uh, circle keeper, basically, and they'll make sure that the, the agreement is fulfilled. You know, if they're not making their weekly meetings with the facilitator mm -hmm. or they're not making you know their commitment that they're supposed to do you know they'll contact they'll give them a warning and say okay, okay. this is warning number one sure. you know you're not following through with what you agreed upon mm -hmm. um, and then if it happens again they'll do um, a second warning but more with me talking to the person saying listen you are given this opportunity to work on this agreement before you go to court if in fact you're not willing to do this, then 
then it comes back to me at that point on the third time and we just file the charges with court and at that point it goes forward to the courthouse so all of the referrals that I think you're talking about now uh, come prior to court even becoming involved, right? Well, most of them. M yeah, probably okay. I'd say ninety percent of them. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are some that come from court. But there's a huge shift uh, right now that's going on within the court, mm -hmm. where they're actually mandating, as part of release, as part of probation, to complete a circle process. Um, we use this process. Um, in a very large arson case. I don't know if you remember the buses that were burned in Littleton. Um, but part of their probation was they had to complete the circle process through C4RJ. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just one of the portions of that they were given through probation. Right. But if they didn't commit and fulfill their agreement, it was going to be considered a violation of probation at that point. Okay. And, you know, we had probation that were, was involved in that whole entire process at that time. Okay. So it worked out. So, Aaron, you have, you've gone through the circle process. You come up with a plan. What is the plan? Mm -hmm. Well, it's different for every case, and that's the beauty also of restorative justice um, because we have as many options as the people in the circle can think of, and the circle together comes up to determine whether or not it's reasonable, whether or not it's achievable in the time frame that they have, and um, making sure that it's realistic, that the person of this age and ability will actually be able to follow through. Um, and so it could be anything from Apology letters oftentimes are seen, and these are letters that our volunteers and our facilitators work with the offender to make sure that they're meaningful, that they actually are, are not just something you write on the back of a scratch pad, especially when we're dealing with a lot of times the younger uh, individuals. We want to make sure that it's meaningful to the other side. It could also be some sort of service. I don't like to call things just blanket community service. Mm -hmm. The service needs to be meaningful and it needs to be closely tied to either the person that was harmed or the community that was impacted or the type of harm that was committed. So for instance, you mentioned the conservation. Right. Um, if conf the conversation land and um, organization were the impacted, mm -hmm. then the service could be back to them. Right. And, and it has to definitely be relevant to one, the crime, and to the victim. And a lot of the times, if the victim requests, um, maybe one of their charities needs some help. Mm -hmm. um, I remember one, um, offender that we had, um, the victim was heavily involved in loaves and fishes and thought it would be very good for this person to volunteer at least 10 hours at loaves and fishes mm -hmm. to see, you know, the poverty that can be out there that certain people. And that was their charity they chose and we thought it was, you know, a, a great resource for us to use. How has that uh, affected the offender who, who, who's gone through the, uh, that process? Well, I think it comes down to the closing circle at that point. Mm -hmm. And again, the closing okay. circle is basically, I would say, a celebration mm -hmm. that we were able to, you know, mend the harms that were done within the community. Mm -hmm. The victim was able to get their day across from, from the offender. And, you know, it, we'll go around the circle again. Okay, you wrote the apology letter. Now tell us a little bit about ap the apology letter and why you wrote it and what you meant by it. You know, was it just, I'm sorry, and hand it in? No, we make them write a very lengthy apology letter as to what they did, why they're sorry for what they did, and how they plan on working through it in the future if something like this were to arise. Um, again, we'll have uh, the, the victim, maybe their community service, you know, okay, tell us a little bit about your community service. I see you volunteered 10 hours here at uh, Loaves and Fishes, for example. Tell us about that. And the victim will tell you, you know, the one that we did, the victim will say, it, it was amazing to see the people that needed some assistance, and I'm taking a lot of this for granted now. So it, it, it really it works out pretty well, especially with the, um, with the community service or the, the volunteer service. So a successful outcome yep. would be at the closing circle where it looks like everybody or that the offender has complied with the plan. Correct. Things are, things are moving forward. Um, that's some of the short-term benefits. Can you, do you, can you tell me about well, any long-term benefits well, that long, you may have seen? Yeah, lo some of the long-term benefits that I've seen mm -hmm. is, um, and I spoke about it a little earlier, Chris, was we, made it, we mandated um, one of our offenders uh, attend uh, counseling sessions. Right. And um, a year later, I, I knew the offender was still attending the counseling sessions because I made a bond with that offender. And, and it, you know, it was an anger management thing that they're working through. And I, I think 
that if we didn't intervene at that point in time mm -hmm. and mandate them to have some kind of therapy session or some kind of counseling session, that that probably would have been overlooked at any point in time. Mm -hmm. So they were continuing in with the sessions long after they had to? After we had to, mm -hmm. yeah. They, they made a connection there with the therapist and they kept going. And another long-term benefit for our communities, mm -hmm. first of all, is, is lower recidivism. People do not reoffend as at high of a rate with restorative justice as they might otherwise. So nationally, the average is right around 37% of people will reoffend um, with the traditional criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. um, there, there was a meta-analysis that was done to compare restorative justice programs across the nation which there are all different types and people don't do it the same way and it looks different in every community right. as it should. Um, and it can happen at different junctures of the legal process. So it, it will look different across the board. Mm -hmm. So there was a meta-analysis done that compared the traditional process to restorative justice processes and found that with restorative justice, the recidivism rate was right around 18%. So that's almost half as many people. And C4RJ actually did a 10-year study because we're 15 years old. So in 2010, they looked back through all of their cases for the last decade. Mm -hmm. So this is impactful because yeah. it's not just did they stay out of trouble for six months, six months right. or did they stay out of trouble for a year or 18 months Correct. while someone was looking over their shoulder. This was looking at some cases for a decade and they found that the recidivism rate was more like 16%. So lower than the yeah. national average for other restorative right. justice programs. And I think a long-term benefit for our communities is this relationship with the police. Yeah. It changes the paradigm. And certainly in our society right now, that's really important. It is. It's an important value to know that your police officers are working for the betterment of their community and all of the citizens. Right. And that's really why you do what you do. That's correct. And um, through the restorative justice process, some offenders are able to get a better perspective there. Yeah. And, and build and relationships. I was going to say, have a better connection also right. with the law enforcement uh, career. Right. That aspect of it. But I think one of the things also, Chris, that I'd like to touch upon if we have time is, sure. um, you know, a lot of times they'll say, well, this person's already been to court um, for two separate larcenies. Right. You know, are you going to be able to use restorative justice for this? Well, if they've committed a larceny before and they committed a larceny again and they went to court both times, is that really working? So let's take a different look at it. Let's try a different toolbox, mm -hmm. open up a new tool, and try it out. You know, let's try the restorative justice portion of this, see if it works. And if it doesn't work, well, then we still can fall back on the charges and go to court. So who would you consider to be the perfect person to be referred? Somebody who may have that under their belt already, a couple of charges. Somebody who's new to the system, might be a first arrest. What, what yeah. would you see as I think Aaron and I may differ upon this answer. Um, mm -hmm. The perfect person for this, or the perfect case for this, mm -hmm. is someone that basically is a first time offender, someone that um, has a direct victim involved. You know, like an abuse case, uh, uh, a drug or alcohol abuse. There's no real victim for us to sink our teeth into for that person to sit across from. Okay. You know, we have to find a, a good case. Um, for it to, 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 to come, complete the circle. To, yeah, to come to as a whole. Sure. Um, it's more meaningful. It really is. Right. It is. So as for one person to fit the criteria as a perfect candidate, I don't think there really is a perfect person for that, for that, okay. that criteria. Mm. Do you mm -hmm. agree? Or? I, th I always tell people it doesn't matter what the offense is and it doesn't matter, um, in my opinion, whether they're a first timer or, or, right. or a multiple uh, time offender. Mm -hmm. Uh, it really comes down to the people involved and especially the phase in life because right. you might have a person that has two or three petty offenses that they just didn't get it. Right. They just didn't care. And there are a lot of people that might fit that bill and they get to a point in their life where something's different. For some reason, they're willing to take responsibility. They're ready to take responsibility. And at that point in time, it might be good for a person where if you caught them five years earlier, they might not have been yeah. good for the process. Yeah, I think that's a great point, too. They're willing to want to cooperate and willing to go forward with mm -hmm. the restorative justice portion, whereas when you go to court, you really don't have a choice at right. that point in time. Right. <clears throat> you know, and you know, it, as far as uh, youthful offenders, um, they, colleges look at their criminal background, and this could mean thousands upon dollars of scholarship money that they're not going to get now because they've been to court for a sure. larceny, for a vandalism, for disturbing the peace. Mm -hmm. If they've been to court and they have a court case in their background, 
that could mean, like I said, thousands of dollars sure. in, in scholarships. That's a very good point. So if we can keep someone's record cleansed, then through restorative justice and have a better outcome, then why not give it a try? And we really do try to get cases pre-arraignment because mm -hmm. in Massachusetts there is no such thing as expungement, and so the moment you're arraigned, yeah. you have that That's record. That's when it's designated on the Board of Probation. Absolutely, records, yeah. and it doesn't matter if you're found not guilty. It doesn't matter if the case is null pressed. It does not matter if it's just dismissed. Right. Um, that person will have <coughs> a record, and so mm -hmm. we try to get as many cases pre-arraignment as we can. But I mentioned earlier, um, before we came on the, the show, that there's legislation pending. That was my next question. In yeah. Massachusetts. Um, yeah. I've read your mind. <laughs> but um, there's legislation pending that would make restorative justice an option at different junctures of the legal process. So not just pre-arraignment or diversion, but also as that tool later down in the system. Because Matt's right, we want to be an additional resource, an uh -huh. additional tool, tool for the legal process. Because there are certain factors that you're just not going to be able to get through the court process, even if it goes swimmingly. Sure. Um, a yeah. lot of times, yeah. everybody in the system can be doing their job and do it well and come out with a resolution that's not satisfactory to the victim or possibly to the offender getting what they need yeah. um, to I'll not reoffend. I'll tell you, um, the Communities for Restorative Justice would, mm -hmm. would be a tremendous um, uh, asset or is a tremendous asset mm -hmm. to uh, to the community, I think, as far as what might be available, uh, right. not just f through police referrals, but through court, mm -hmm. through defense attorneys. Even the referrals. schools are starting to use them too, Chris, mm -hmm. uh, especially with a lot of the bullying that's going on as right. referrals. Right. That's, the opportunities uh, are endless. Unfortunately, um, we're uh, we're running down to uh, to the end of the show. I'd like to like to continue this discussion, but. Uh, uh, I, I want to thank Aaron Freeborn for uh, for joining us, as well as uh, Sergeant Matthew Pennard. Uh, this has been Legal Ease, and I uh, I thank you for uh, for watching. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it.